Hello, everyone, oh, and welcome to the Kentucky Small Business Development Center's weekly webinar. We're glad you're here. As we allow attendees a few moments to join our event, we'd like to share some information about the Kentucky SBDC. As a uh, statewide nationally accredited program that provides entrepreneurial and business development services, the Kentucky SBDC plays a vital role in the Commonwealth's economic development by assisting entrepreneurs at every stage of their business life cycle. For almost 40 years now, the Kentucky SBDC has assisted in merging and growing businesses by providing the professional expertise, tools, and information necessary to make sound business decisions in a complex and ever-changing marketplace. We do this at no cost to our clients, thanks to the U.S. Small Business Administration, who co-sponsors our program, uh, which is then administered by the University of Kentucky in partnership with regional universities, uh, community colleges, and local economic development agencies. We're part of a national network, America's SBDC, with over 1,000 1, centers across the nation, as well as some U.S. territories. To learn more about us, you can visit it visit us at kybizhelp.com. There you'll find additional resources to help start, fund, and grow your business. To request personal assistance, email info at kybizhelp.com or call us at 888-475-7232. A recording of today's webinar will be emailed to you this afternoon, so if for any reason you need to step away, you'll have access to the entire recording later today. If you look to the right of your screen, you'll find the chat feature if you have any questions for our presenter, you can post them here and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. If you want to go ahead and check that out now and tell us where you're joining us from today, uh, we'd appreciate seeing that. I'm Janet Flom with the Louisville Center, one of 12 centers throughout the Commonwealth. And with me today are my colleagues from the Louisville Center, Dave Etkin, our center director, and Tony Sears, our assistant center director. So good Wednesday afternoon to you guys. Hey, Janet, how are you? I'm doing great today, doing great today. It's a beautiful uh, holiday weekend and got some things accomplished and got into the outdoors, so that was all great. How about you? Good, doing great. And Tony, how about you? Hi, Dave. Hey, Janet. How are you all doing? Hey, good, Tony. We are awesome. We got some people. We got some people in from Glasgow today, you all, so we want to say hello to Glasgow. Yay. <laughs> Excellent. So, well, today's a, a, a big day because uh, we have a very special guest, um, Mark S.A. Smith, who um, has been running his own company for over 30 years. And, and what's really exciting is, is that uh, way back in the early 90s when he launched, he launched with the help of the Small Business Development Center and went through several of the Small Business Development Center programs, especially the, uh, the Fast Start program and, and uh, tapped into those resources. But... Mark is an expert in uh, leadership, sales, marketing, and customer acquisition systems. He's also the author of 14 popular books and sales, sales guides. He guides. He's an author of more than 400 articles. He's a genuine guru, guerrilla marketing guru, authoring three books with Jay Conrad Levinson and is uh, part of the, uh, the guerrilla marketing um, brand. He's also, uh, and I said this earlier, he's the most interesting man in the world. He is the, he is, he's living the great lifestyle, lifestyle of, of a digital nomad, running his company, traveling the West, um, just seeing what he sees and, and doing what he wants to do. And also, um, you know, keeping up with business as he, as he goes where he wants to go. And um, when I, I want to be just like you when I grew up someday, Mark. So tell us how to get <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Thanks for that introduction, uh, and, and I can't wait to hear what I have to say based on that introduction. But no, it's it's a it's a wonderful life. Uh, these days, we can if you can run an internet based business, which I do as a consultant and an author, we can live anywhere that we feel like living. But uh, there is a couple of caveats. Number one is you have to have kids out of the house, and I do. All five of my children live in their own homes, which is quite a a feat these days. Number two is you have to have a wife or an ex-wife that doesn't care where you live. <laughs> and number three, you have to have access to a decent internet connection no matter where you go. And so that means I carry two cell phones with two different carriers, and uh, that's what we're doing today. So thanks for that introduction. Are we ready to go? Let's do it. Can't wait. All right. Me too. I can't wait as well. Well, thank you all uh, for joining us today. 
And I'm Mark S. A. Smith. Now, if you need to find me, you have to use both initials, Mark S. and A. with a Smith. But here's my contact information. Today, I'm going to talk about wise leadership instincts, the difference between surviving and thriving. And this is uh, really a, pre, a, a peek on the next book that I'm re- uh, writing, my 15th book, which is one of the reasons why I'm on the road interviewing people and uh, talking to businesses. And I want to share with you some of the things that I've learned along the way. Feel free to ask questions in the chat. Dave is going to help manage that for me. And uh, let's get started with things that you can do. So first of all, I want you to think about this. What do you want from today's event? What kind of ideas are you looking for? Today, we're going to be talking about your leadership instincts, which is knowing what to do exactly, the right thing to do. Maybe what mindset are you looking for? How can you get through the challenging six months that we've all been facing? This, this is tough. I've never seen anything like this. I've been through a lot of business cycles in my life, but never anything like this that's worldwide and so comprehensively disruptive. Maybe you're looking for some new skill sets. So for example, staying positive in tough times. How will you know the session is worth it? I just want you to think about that for a moment. And and while you do, I want to let you know that today you can expect a few things. Number one is you can expect to, you can expect to hear some things you already know, but I'm going to ask you to think about them in a new way. I'm going to ask you to think about things that you used to do, and I'm going to remind you it's time to do them again. And without a doubt, I've got some new ideas for you. And when you choose to use them, they'll make you as successful as you wish. So now that you know what you'd like out of the day, this, let's just talk a little bit about the scenario that we're in. You're leading in the toughest of times. The world will never be the same. This is a picture of Grand Central Station in New York City. And this is a picture of Broadway in New York City. And this is the Las Vegas Strip. I lived in Vegas for five years before departing. In fact, I still keep my stuff in Las Vegas. But uh, (laughs) I figured as long as the lights were on in Vegas, I'd be okay. Well, the lights went out in Vegas. And this is Los Angeles. You can actually see the buildings and you can actually navigate the freeway. This kind of disruption is absolutely insane for business. and. If, if you're in the midst of a startup or if you're trying to keep your business afloat or you're thinking about moving uh, out of your business and selling it, these are really, really tough times. And stay with it. You're, we're going to make through it. I, we, I guarantee you that. I've been through some tough times and you're going to survive too. But this disruption is what we're going to see going forward. I don't like to use the word new normal because as Harley Quinn says on uh, the death squad, Normal is just a setting on the dryer. There is no normal, friend. There is no normal. Expect for disruption to continue. Technology disruption, political disruption, just, just that's the way it is. So let's just talk about what disruption means. It's an, in, an intentional or unintentional changes to principal elements of your experience. You recognize that, don't you? which often challenges your personal identity. Who am I? One of the reasons why a lot of us feel so weird is we just don't know who we are in this environment and which triggers either growth or death. Growth or death of your personality, of your business, even you know, suicide rates are up. It's just crazy. Well, we have to learn how to deal with these things. Disruption is the way of life going forward. It just happens to be accelerating in our lifetime. So the way we deal with this is Eric Hoffer said, in times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. (laughs) So part of what we have to do is learn how to unlearn and relearn fast. And quite frankly, that's my secret, is I unlearn as much as I learn. I, I cannot rely on my learning. It has to be relearned all the time. Now, you probably have seen this before, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. This is a really important uh, tool for you as a leader because it helps you understand a person's mindset. So Leadership 101, solve first for mindset when you're leading your team. Do they have the capacity of being led? Well, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, most people have been down here on the psychological level of Maslow's hierarchy Uh, and and at the safety level. They're worried about employment. They're worried of where they're going to live. And at this, these bottom two levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you can only think of one or two things at a time. And that is to change your state to move up. Now, you as a leader have to be leading from the top of Maslow's hierarchy. You cannot lead from the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. It doesn't work. You're, it's truly the leading the blind or the dumb leading the dumb. It just doesn't work. So you have to manage your mindset to get the top level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Understand at the bottom level, you can only think of one thing at a time. Your cognitive capacity is reduced to one point. At the top, you can handle lots of complexity. 
and you as a leader must be able to handle complexity. So I, I just wanted to, to, to remind you how important it is when you're working with your team or your customers or your vendors or the people that support you, your family, you have to understand where they are and help them move up. If they're afraid, you have to move them out of fear and let them know it's going to be okay before you can move on. And I want you to move yourself out of that fear for just a moment and, and take some breaths and say, you know, it's going to be okay. And I'm going to get some new tools that are going to help me through this. So as my dear friend, Mark DeMassimo, who runs Digo Brands, they're the folks that bring companies like Weight Watchers and Hewitt Jackson and other household brands, advertising, they handle that advertising. He says that the job, the first job of a leader is to define reality. And you have to define your future reality re without regard to the current reality you're currently in. That's why they called it a leader. You're going moving forward. You are future focused. Yes, you have to deal with the now. But your job is to bring the resources so you can move forward. Are you up for that? So what do I mean by wise leadership instinct? In humans, cognitive instinct, because that's what we have, is cognitive instinct versus really built-in instinct, comes from unconscious competence. In other words, you, you just know what to do without thinking about it. And the very best leaders have this unconscious instinctive approach that has been installed over time. So some examples of this unconscious competence is driving in normal traffic. You know, you can talk on the phone and you can eat and you can have a conversation with a person when traffic is normal. Of course, if the complexity gets a little higher, then you have to stop things and focus your attention on what you're doing or multitasking at your level of cognitive capacity. That means you have the ability to handle lots of things at the same time. And it's your leadership during times of limited disruption. You can handle that quite well. So how do we increase this unconscious competence to increase your capacity to have this instinctive leadership? Well, competence increases with mastering wise leadership principles. It's principle-based. And self-awareness, which is critical to being a successful leader, resulting in instinctive actions where you know exactly what to do and the people that you lead are just in awe of your capacity to go, oh, wow, I wouldn't have thought of that. Well, now they did. Now they're moving towards their instinctive leadership. Well, the way that this grows is through these four levels of learning that have been kicking around since 1969, talked about by Martin Broadwell. And you so say you start off with unconscious competence. You don't even know. You're blissfully ignorant that leadership is something that you need to be doing. And maybe, maybe that you're facing a situation you haven't faced before. And so you have this aha awareness stage where you go to this conscious incompetence. You know, I know I need to do something, but I don't know what it is, and I'm not very good at it. And unfortunately, a lot of times people are not um, willing to admit this level of conscious incompetence, yet that's where your capacity to learn starts. My capacity to learn starts when I say, I don't know, but I want to know. That's where it starts. You can't know it all, but you can know what you know, and you can know what you don't know. And as a leader, knowing what you don't know is probably more important than knowing what you know. Otherwise, you act on bad advice. So then you move to conscious competence. This is where you're going to go through some learning and change, and there might be some ouches along the way. And as you get uh, more and more in, uh, as part of your habit, as part of your identity, then we can move to mastery where these things become second nature. And that's where leadership instinct lives. So the challenge that we face, though, is that despite our best intentions, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be able to lead at our best intentions in times of challenge. Archilochus says, we don't rise to the level of our expectations, we fall to the level of our training. And that's where most of us are right now, and, and it's hard to, to do education and training when you're at that lower level of Maslow's hierarchy as we've been forced into through the media and all the insanity that's going on right now. So you got to put yourself on a diet and move yourself up positively so that you can get to that state where you can learn. Another view of this is the Johari window. You probably are familiar with this Johari window concept, which is really important to you as a leader. And this is concept of, you know, if you're self-aware of, of your capacities or your, your, your strengths or your weaknesses, or you're unaware, you're completely blind to it, versus how others are aware, how unaware, and it creates these four quadrants to allow us to decide how we're going to develop ourselves. So we have the, uh, you're aware, others are aware. This is the arena that we live in. And this is obvious to me and it's obvious to others. And so we get along really well because we agree to agree. 
Now, there may be a facade here, which is it's obvious to you, but it's not obvious to others. So that's that part that you might keep private. And so that's called the facade. Then we have the blind spot. And that's where others are aware of your lack or your weakness or your strength, but you're not. It's oblivious to you and obvious to others. That's the blind spot. And that's the part that can kill us as leaders. Blind spots can kill an organization. And because you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> And then down here is the unknown. It's oblivious to you and others. Well, the way we grow ourselves is, number one, start to create the self-awareness by self-discovery, moving the unknown to the facade. So, and that should be a lifelong pursuit. And I'll give you some, some strategies of increasing your self-awareness because this is how we increase our instinctive reactions to leadership challenges. To move from the facade to the arena, this is where authenticity comes into play. And this is where you're okay with your shadow. You're okay with your bright. You're okay with your weaknesses. You're okay with your strengths. I'm a lousy athlete. I'm a great thinker. I'm a futurist. I'm not really good at history. <laughs> so it's okay for you to admit those things and then surround yourselves or give yourself access to backfill those, those areas that you're not terribly strong, but authenticity, being okay. The way you move from your blind spot to the arena is by feedback by people you trust. And this is an important way for you to do the self-development. So the Johari window was created by psychologist Joseph Lufton, Harrington Ingram in 1955, and it was named by the Joe Hari of their name. How clever. <laughs> All right, so here's how you can improve your self-awareness. Number one, and I got to say, this is probably one of the most important leadership secrets that there is, and that's journaling your thoughts and plans and track your progress. And many, many people who are in the business of massive self-development will tell you, you've got to write down your plans and you've got to hold yourself accountable. Now, if you're saying, I don't have time for this, that's a prime indication that you've got blind spots that you do not want to have exposed. Well, make friends with those blind spots. Make friends with your shadow. And you perhaps lack personal accountability around some areas you need to grow. So I am a almost daily journal person. I, I write in my journal almost every day. And uh, I find that when I do, the insights that I need come forth that I can then share with my tribe and my team. Number two is meditate, consider, and reflect. If you've watched Tim Ferriss, the four-hour work week, listen to his show, one of the questions they ask almost every one of his guests is, do you have a meditation practice? And more than 95% of the people say, yes, I do. And then he'll ask, well, what kind of meditation do you use? And it really doesn't matter what you choose, whether you choose to pray or use guided meditations, or if you have your own methodology, it doesn't matter. It's that concept of getting quiet and looking inward so that you have self-awareness that you can then operate from the highest levels of Maslow's hierarchy so that you can be an effective leader. So meditation and journaling are ways to pull yourself up out of the quagmire and start looking forward. So ask a lot of why do I questions to understand those areas that you need to develop and do not give yourself a pass. You cannot say I've always done it that way. That is a surefire barrier to your future success. I've always done it that way. No, that's not good enough. We're in a world of disruption. I've always done it that way. It kills companies and it kills leaders. Number three, always be unlearning and relearning. Lifelong learning is the hallmark of instinctive leaders because the context changes, tactics change. Now, leadership principles tend to stay the same. And that's what we're trying to install with leadership instinct. Number four is get a coach. A good coach doesn't make you wrong. It makes you strong. I work with executives and help them develop their strengths, backfill their weaknesses so they can be strong. I also have coaches. I have three coaches that I work with to help me be a better leader and a better coach. Executive coaches can knock years off of your development and can save you massive amounts of stupid tax where you make a choice without understanding the complexity of it, the perspective that's required and the context that you need to have in play to make that work. I guarantee you, a coach is way less expensive than the stupid tax you will pay by making unguided decisions early and even later in your career. Number five is gain perspective without judgment. 
all good leaders get the perspective from their teams, their executive teams, their vendors, their families, from their SBDC. <laughs> but don't do so with judgment until you have the big picture. And if a person gives you a perspective, the best thing to say is, I will take that into consideration. Don't say, I agree or I disagree. Mm -mm. That's not the right way to handle that perspective gathering. It's, I'm going to take that into consideration. Thank you for your viewpoint. That's how you lead it. Leave that conversation. Then after you gain your whole perspective, you can lay it out and say, I see the direction that we need to go based on this total perspective. Thank you. For your perspective, I'm going to go a different direction, but your perspective gave me what I needed to make that informed decision. Then number six, take assessments to gain personal insights. Things such as strength finders or the DISC assessment or the Colby assessment. There's so many different great assessments that can help you get some understanding in your skills, especially as you're developing as a leader. Now take them with a grain of salt as they are a snapshot of where you are right now. It's not necessarily reality. It's an indication of what reality might be. And then from that, you can either embrace those strengths or grow your areas where you need to get a little stronger. All right. So let's talk about some first principles that I want to share with you that you can use. First of all, as a leader oversees and delivers these five layers of capacity, you start off with principles, leadership principles. And I've already given you one powerful principle, which is solve first for mindset. We talked about that with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's one of the fundamental principles is solving for the mindset of the people you want to lead. And that you're looking, you know, if there is a challenge, is it that they don't know what to do? They can't do what you're asking or they don't care about the direction you're leading. So don't know, can't do, don't care. It's usually one or more of those three elements. Well, don't know requires training can't do requires tools or reassignment to things they can do. Don't care means let's align with their motivation or move them into a position they can manage or they can find motivating as they go forward. Now, see, there's a difference between uh, motivation and inspiration. And the difference is motivation comes from the outside and inspiration from the inside. And quite frankly, back to Maslow's, the bottom two levels, only motivation works there. And the top levels, the top three, only inspiration works. Now, that's a leadership principle that's a little deeper than we really have time to go into today. But I wanted to give you a quick preview that when it comes to motivating people or inspiring people, mindset matters. Okay, that's a, a principle. So your job to gain those leaderships is to understand those principles. Second level is to take those principles and build a system. A system is a machine that allows you to drive inputs, get outputs, control what's going on within there. And therefore that's a business system that will produce predictable outputs based on the inputs. That's what you have to put together if you're going to have a business that be sustainable and scalable and profitable and ultimately saleable to somebody else. You have to build a system. Well, I'm trained as an electrical engineer. I'm a systems thinker. And everything I do is based on this concept of let's put together a system that's going to allow us to have reliability and repeatability, and it's going to help us insulate against disruption. That doesn't mean that systems can't be disrupted. <laughs> they, 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 they are all the time. Uh, but it means that when the disruption comes along, we at least have a systematic approach that we can use to harness the disruption or deflect the disruption. Within that system, we have the level of control. Control allows us to decide how much we create, what the levels of the inputs and the outputs are. That control is what allows us to run a business because control allows management. Management is what your job is to ultimately to offer to other people. I need for you to manage this part of my business. Then those, that management ends up in the results that we're looking for. It's what your customers buy. It's what they pay for. It's what you're known for. So when I work with my clients, we look at this as a way of identifying where we need to work on their leadership. Is it a principles issue? Do they have a systems issue? I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end of today's conversation. Is it a control issue? Is it a management issue? Or is it a results? You're creating results that people don't care about or they're not willing to pay for because that's another one of those levels of disruption. So think about that as you discover and have conversations around 
your company and what you need to, how do you need to lead them? Peter F. Drucker, fantastic management consultant, says results are obtained by exploiting opportunities, not by solving problems. This is an important leadership principle. And the reason why is because if all you are doing is solving a problem, your value ends when that problem is solved versus exploiting opportunities. And I don't mean exploitation in a negative sense. It just means that what we're going to do is take advantage of the situation we're in right now and look for ways of delivering services and goods that people want and exchanging that for fair value. So there's lots and lots of opportunities that are being offered to you in the heart of all this insanity. For me, it allowed me to reinvent my life and reinvent my business and write my next book. <laughs> and so you too may want to use this disruption as a way of saying, okay, where are the opportunities for me to exploit? Leaders exploit opportunities, managers solve problems. So let me give you a, a couple of leadership instinct principles that might uh, light you up a little bit. First of all, leaders efficiently direct the available capital, people, technology, and systems to achieve a desired outcome, and they take responsibility and accountability for the results. Now, you need to make sure that all those things are on your list as the leader of your organization, and if they're not, there is a crack in your system, and you're not going to be sustainable. Number two is business leaders oversee a sustainable, that means it's going to keep going through business cycles, scalable, it means it's going to grow up during good times. It's going to grow down. You can shrink it. Yeah, yeah, you can successfully when you are in a business cycle. All businesses go through cycles. I've been through I don't know, half a dozen of them in my life. Scale up, scale down, reinvent, open a new business. So it's just That's how this works. Nothing is forever in the world of business. Nothing is forever in this world. <laughs> Profitable. And yes, profitable is third on the list because if it's not sustainable and scalable, profitable doesn't matter. Profitable short-term is not a business. It's a one-hit wonder. And then saleable. Ultimately, you're going to want to sell your company and cash in on all of that work that you have performed getting that value. I see a lot of entrepreneurial souls that pay themselves a pittance, typically $35 an hour, when you take into account the hundreds of hours they work every week, they underpay themselves substantially and they're betting that their business is going to grow and ultimately they can cash out and recoup all that sweat equity investment. And the sad truth is most don't. That happened to you. It's not necessary. What is necessary is that you view a business as being saleable. Now, personally, my business isn't because I provide personal experiences to executives, and I do that because lifestyle business. I live to hang out with smart people who are doing sub substantial things. I don't need a lot of money. What I want is intellectual stimulation and to help them do substantial things. That's my play. But I've went into this business knowing I would have an unsaleable business, yet I am in the process of changing that. I've decided it's time for me to create a saleable business. Three years ago, I mean, three years from now, <laughs> I'll have a business that I can sell. I need for you to think about that. It's an important aspect for you as a leader. And then innovative leaders create a future that does not exist. Mm -mm, doesn't exist yet. No, using methods that have not yet been invented. Yeah, you're leading into the future with best practices that have not yet been established. So if you're not certain about where you're wanting to go next, take heart. That's your job. <laughs> All right. Successful leaders think about things differently. So what do you think is the most valuable asset to a leader? I'll give you a hint. It's not time. It's not. You can buy time. That's what employees and tools and vendors are for. You can purchase the equivalent of time. No, your most valuable asset isn't time. It's your cognitive capacity. It's your ability to handle complexity. It's your ability to think forward into the future. Leaders have the longest time view of anybody on the team because they're looking out beyond where they're going to lead that team. And you might be thinking, Mark, I'm just trying to pedal as fast as I can to keep up with what I got going on right now. Well, you're not leading your business. You're managing your business. And that's okay. It's okay. But don't fool yourself into thinking you're a leader if you're just trying to keep up. That's a manager. 
if you want to lead, you're going to have to do some different things. Now, let me share with you some of those things that you might want to do. All right, so you have to be okay with uncertainty as you're leading. You have to have confidence over certainty. Leaders have confidence versus certainty. They're dealing with in, incomplete data, but they have a confidence that where they're going is the right direction for themselves. And they have clarity over comfort. And that clarity is knowing the next step that you want to take, knowing in your vision where you want to go. Now, if you want to have a philosophical conversation about that, invite me on up. We'll have some bourbon and I'll fill you on some of the deeper, darker background of how this all works out. But for now, <laughs> let's talk about some other things that you need to do as a leader to do this. You have to be open-minded. You have to say, what else could this mean? When you're presented with a piece of data or when your employee comes to you in tears or when your vendor comes to you and say, eh, we're going to have to cut back production. We don't have enough for you. You're going to have to ask yourself, what else could this mean? Because context matters. Context is the culture that you're working within. It's the filter and the focus that you bring to the party based on your past experience and how you're raised in your family and, and how you went through business so far. It happens to be based on your history or the history that you take into account when you think about the future. It's based on your experiences so far in life. It's based on the environment. Of course, our current environment is just absolutely insane. Depends on the resources you have available. More resources changes the con context. Fewer resources changes the context. And also the perspective that you have. All of these things are your context. And so that truly matters. And you as the leader have to have the broadest, the broadest perspective. And you have to take this context into account as you're just making your leadership decisions. Only make decisions when they're due. This is an important leadership aspect for uh, the reason that timing, perspective, resources, and priorities can change as you get closer to your need to make a decision. You can only make a certain number of decisions in a day. It's true. You can only make a certain number of decisions in a day and you run out of cognitive capacity. So you may need to make the most important decisions when your cognitive capacity is the highest, which for most people is about two hours after they get out of bed. So save that prime time for your biggest thinking time, not doing the tasks that, that uh, aren't important, but those that are important. So uh, this concept of making decisions is really important only when they're due. The, the other aspect is it keeps you from uh, being tricked into cognitive bias, uh, confirmation bias, where you make a decision that all of a sudden all the data that comes into your awareness, you choose to filter to support that decision, where I guarantee you if you made that opposite decision, you'd also see bias coming in to support that opposite decision. But if you can hold yourself without making a judgment, you're going to gather as much information as you possibly can before making a decision, you're much more likely to make a good decision. Let me give you another principle. Few decisions are final or fatal. <laughs> that should give you a little bit of comfort. And then mental toughness. Leaders must handle the most diversity, adversity of anybody in the organization. You have to be the toughest in your organization. And if that doesn't work for you, you may want to be an employee instead of running a business. Nothing the matter with that. Nothing at all. Being a leader is demanding. It's tough. It requires a lot of resources. There is more on your shoulders than on anybody else in the organization. So you may not be really a leader. And that's okay. If you're exploring leadership and it's not going to work out for you, that's okay. You'll be all right. You'll be better off for it. And it's a whole lot better to, to be a manager who's happy than a leader who's middle. <laughs> so here are the strategic directives of a leader. These are the four things you have to think about every day. This is part of your leadership instinct. Number is your vision. A vision is what they'll say about you and your company at your eulogy. This is what you're going to make happen. This is They're going to say, you made this, this person made this happen. It's why your team will follow you because they see your vision. They agree with your vision. They want to be part of that vision. And it's why stakeholders will give you money. Can't get funding. It means your vision isn't clear enough or valuable enough to people to invest in. That's the reason why you're not getting money. It's a vision problem or a vision articulation problem. Second thing you look at is value. Value is why customers choose you to do business with. It's why the competition fears and respects you. And it's ultimately why somebody would buy your company from you. Mm -hmm. Value. This is an ever-moving target. 
Value keeps moving. It's one of those disruptors that we have to pay attention to. Number three is velocity. All right, how fast are you going to accomplish this? Growth in an entrepreneurial business for growth sake is not a good idea. It's how people get burnt out. They get overextended. They go into a slump. Business cycles come. They're disrupted and they crash and burn. It's because of inappropriate velocity choices. The velocity of your business should be as fast as you are willing to take it. It should make your, your uh, team slightly uncomfortable and it should make you excited. So velocity and then valor. Valor is how you face challenges and mitigate risk and danger. It's the solidness that you use as you approach your business. These are the four elements that you have to focus on every day as how are we doing towards the vision? Does my vision need to be adjusted? This is the longest range aspect. Value. What are we doing today to provide value for our customers? How is their desire for value different? How is their view of value changing? What's the velocity I want to be taking this? Do I want to slow it down a little bit? Do I want to speed it up a little bit? My friend, do not allow your sales team or your marketing team determine your velocity. You determine the velocity. If they're saying we can't go that fast, you need new people. They don't understand what's going on. <laughs> velocity is a combination. Velocity potential is a combination of vision and value. And then valor. You may have to tough, uh, face some tough situations. You may have to fire a customer. You may have to fire an employee. You may have to fire a spouse. It happens. <laughs> and so these are the four things you look at every day as a leader. And you'll get input and perspective from others. But this is ultimately your need. This is what you do. Yeah. All right. Successful more on their to think list than on their to do list. So make sure you have more on your th to think list than on your to do list. To do's go to your man. And if you're just a one person operation, I get it. Yeah, really, it's true. But you need to be planning for the future when you're going to be offloading those tactical tasks to others who can do them at a lower cost and probably a better result. <laughs> so when it comes to modern leadership essentials, this is the executive strategy skill stack that I've, I've, I've identified as I've worked with leaders over the past three decades. And these are the seven fundamentals you must possess in roughly this order of importance if you're going to be a successful leader running a sustainable, scalable, profitably, and profitable, and ultimately scalable business. So number one on the list is you have to have presence. That's the ability to command a person's attention. If you don't have this, it's going to be impossible for you to lead. And presence is a combination of emotional intelligence plus personal mastery, self-awareness, and authenticity. So this is what we started off talking about, if you think about that. This is exactly what I was talking about you and your self-development, your self-awareness. This is what generates presence. And this generates charismatic leadership. And if you haven't got this, you got to work on this. Otherwise, it's going to be really difficult to go beyond a solo operator. You, it's going to be hard to lead a team. So you have to have presence. Number two is you have to have discipline. I know discipline's a horrible word, but there isn't a better word for it. And what we're talking about is personal discipline and professional discipline. And those are the routines that you can use to make sure that you have the highest level of cognitive capacity. Personal discipline are things such as rest. Yeah, you got to get enough sleep. Exercise. Yeah, you got to move your body. It's not going to do you any good to create a, a wonderful business and then be sick. And you have to have nutrition. Yes, feed your body right because your body is going to support your brain, which is going to support your cognitive capacity, which is the most important thing that you have, your most important asset as a leader. So discipline to do those things. Uh, number three is foresight. You have to be able to predict the future. Otherwise, you can't lead into the future. Now, the good news is there are ways of predicting the future, and I could teach you some of those ways if you'd like sometime. And this is where we're using the vision, value, velocity, and valor elements for us to provide ourselves with that foresight as we move into the future. Remember, your job is to direct the company to where the customer will be spending money in the future. Do you have that capacity? If not, you have limited lifespan as a business. If you do, and you can handle disruption, you're good. <laughs> Number four is business acumen. You have to know how a business operates. And that's a really great part about the uh, SBDC is that you have the capacity of working with people who understand how businesses work. So you have to have understanding of operational strategy, priority, and tactics to make that happen. And I will give you a short course in business acumen. Only takes 30 seconds. And we'll do that in a minute. <laughs> well, here it is. Oh, my goodness. Let's do it this way. 
<laughs> so number one is here are the, the, the seven elements of business acumen you must possess. Uh, number one is product unique value for the target market. Each one of these things are critical. You have to have unique value. In other words, they can't get it exactly that way from anybody else. If you have a me too product, it's going to be a struggle because you're going to have to innovate at levels that you may not have the capacity to fund. So you have to create that unique value and you have to have a target market. You can't make something for everybody. It doesn't work that way because that's not how people buy. People buy saying that's for me. You have to make things that are for them. Number two is you have to have marketing that triggers relevant conversations. The role of marketing is one thing and one thing only, and that's to start a conversation with you, with your team, with your website, <laughs> with your order form. <laughs> Those are all conversations. They have to trigger relevant conversations, and relevant is a really important aspect of that. And uh, this is an area where I've spent my entire life learning how to generate and trigger relevant conversations. And let me tell you, it's not what you think it is. It's actually way more complex. Marketing is a, one of the most misunderstood words in business, probably more misunderstood than sales, <laughs> which is the second most misunderstood business. So you have to really think about your marketing. If, and if word of mouth is your marketing strategy, you don't have a business, you have a hobby. Without a formal funded marketing plan, you do not have a business. You have a prototype business. Because nobody's going to buy a business that doesn't have some sort of marketing, funded marketing strategy in place. That's how you ensure future sales. Marketing is the investment in future sales. Next three, sales that facilitates mutually profitable transaction. Each one of those words is critical. It has to be mutually profitable. You got to get the transaction in there. And it's a facilitation. Nobody closes sales. I hate to tell you this. Nobody closes sales. I've only met one salesperson that actually closed business. That's because he had signature authority on his customer's checking account. <laughs> this guy closed business. He would write himself a check for what he need, what he knew his customer needed that day. No, we facilitate sales. We don't close them. In fact, the word close actually, it, it limits more sales than it creates. Facilitate it, all right? No, doesn't mean that you don't use ways of helping the customer get there faster. That's what the facilitation is all about. Number four is service that earns customer loyalty. Loyalty comes from providing excellent customer service. Number five is operations that scale with economic cycles. This is a critical aspect as we go through business cycles. You have to be able to scale up and scale down. The good news, this is easier to do today than ever before, thanks to software as a service and lots and lots of organizations out there that are willing to operate in a contract basis. Number six is finance that controls cash flow and funds the future. Right now, one of the challenges most people face is they don't have a future, their cash flow is interrupted, and that's where the finance aspect has to be paid attention to. And then number seven is culture that upholds a unique brand experience. As you start to scale up rapidly, your culture becomes your limiting factor or your accelerating factor, depending on how it's defined and installed. So these are your business success pillars. All right, let's finish off with the last three of the executive strategy skill stack. Number five is you have to have communication skills. You as, as the leader of the organization have to have the best communication skills of anybody in there because you're communicating with the team, with the vendors, with the customers, with the government, with your family, and your capacity to communicate clearly and use the right words at the right time becomes a critical aspect of leadership. In fact, we respect leaders that can speak well, speak eloquently, speak compellingly, speak motivationally. Those are all important aspects of leadership. So it's about clarity and also aligning with a person's motivation. I spend a lot of time with my executives, helping them understand how to communicate with their challenging team members, because as the executive, as the leader, you're the one that has to be able to communicate with them well. Number six is persuasion skills. You are negotiating most of your day. You're negotiating with yourself. You're negotiating with vendors, with your spouse, with your customers, with the government. <laughs> There's always a negotiating going on. So if you have not had a solid negotiating class, you must do so. Or at the very, very least, get a copy of Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Look at that. I'm, I'm, I'm advising you to buy somebody else's book over one of my books. Yeah, I wrote a book in negotiating called Guerrilla Negotiating, and it's extraordinary. And it's about how to offset the dirty tricks. It's the antidote to the dirty tricks that buyers play on you to try to get you to reduce your prices. But I got to tell you, 
Chris Voss's book is beyond the tech that he had access to is beyond what I did when I wrote the book back in 94. So they're both good. Read Chris Voss. Chris Voss's book, Never Split the Difference First. Probably the most important chapter to read is chapter three on tactical empathy. That's going to take you way further than almost anything else that I can tell you when it comes to persuasion and negotiating right now. Number seven is you make resourceful and timely decisions. Executives must be able to make the right decisions at the right time, as we talked about earlier in this conversation. You have to be comfortable with uncertainty. It's about efficient allocation and management of the resources you have in your organization, which are your time, your energy. Yep. Cognitive capacity, imagination, money. And look at that cognitive capacity. I'm saying it twice because it's that important. So. Your job is to evaluate how you can rate yourself. How are you in these seven areas of leadership strength? And so to, 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 uh, to, to, to put this into action for you, plan your leadership growth path. And if you don't want to, that's okay too. And this is going to create limits for your future. But if you really do want to run a business and you want to uh, fulfill the vision that you have in mind, you do need to grow your leadership skills. So make learning part of your personal culture as you have today. You showed up today. You've been sitting here for uh, 40, yeah, 46 minutes listening to me uh, share with you the insights that I've gained over the 30 years that I've been working with leaders. Good for you. Thank you. Don't let that stop. And then determine where you need to up-level your skills. And I'll give you the opportunity of taking an assessment that allow you to, to figure out where you are and what you need to up-level and uh, it's on the house. I won't, no charge whatsoever. I'll share with you how to get to that in just a moment. Then identify the value of your improved skills. You have to have some motivation, whether it's internal or external, to take the time to invest into your capacity as a leader, knowing that that's not going to pay off until sometime into the future. So identify what that value is. Then become part of the beta launch of the Leadership Instinct Academy. And I'm in the middle of uh, putting that together based on hundreds of hours of recordings that I have around leadership instinct. It's just time for me to put that into to play. I remember I told you that I'm putting together a saleable business. Yeah, this is this is the one that I'm doing. <laughs> and then take the uh, leadership skills assessment, ondemandu.com slash L-E-A-D is where that starts. Now, I got to tell you, I checked it this morning and I got a problem. So don't go there right now. All right, don't, that's, no, don't do that. All right, it's, it's not going to take you anywhere. You're going to come up with a, a page not found error. So give me a day with my team to get that thing fixed. Just put it on your calendar, check out ondemandu.com slash lead, and I'll get that for you. Um, so what I want to do in the meantime is to give you something you can use absolutely immediately. I'm going to put this up here. You can go to ondemandu.com at the very top. It, there's a place where you can say leadership um, basics and leadership 101. And just click on that link. It's the very top link and on the page. And then go to the order page and use coupon code LEAD101 free. L E A D 101 free. And it's capital L and capital F. Everything else is lowercase. You enter that into the coupon code, it'll give you free access to that $97 training program. Absolutely no charge for you. And there's no expiration on it for those of you that are listening on the playback. That's it. So you go there. Sign up for that free leadership class, and I will send you a link when the assessment is back online. <laughs> All right. Also, I'd like to offer you 20 minutes to talk with me about strategy. Absolutely free. If you'd like to have a conversation with me, here's the link to go. It's gogo.oncehub, O-N-C-E-H-U-B dot com slash E-S-S-S. -S. Those are all capital letters. You have to use the capital letters to get in. Now, that'll give you access to my calendar, and we can have put 20 minutes on the calendar, and let's talk about strategy. That's it. So I don't want to talk about tactics. That's not going to, I'm not, I can't help you there, but I can help you with strategy. And if you'd like to do that, you know, the really sad thing, you know how many folks listening to this program are going to take me up on that 20-minute call? Maybe three. Shame on you. Really? Because I'm serious. Where do you think I learned my stuff? <laughs> Where do you think I learned the, the, the opportunities to exploit, the, the problems to solve? It's by talking to people like you, challenged by your business. I have my business challenges, but I got to gather other people's business challenges too. With that, my friend, we're 50 minutes into the program. Exactly what I promised uh, to do. So Dave, come on back online and let's have some question time. What do you think? That was fabulous, Mark. And, and I've got a ton of questions. And um, 
I'm sure Tony will too, but um, I'll tell you what really, uh, uh, just going back to early in your, in your presentation, something that I really found kind of insightful, and I'd like to ask a couple questions on that before we jump forward, but um, you, you mentioned about journaling, and you know, I read a lot of history, and I noticed that almost all the great leaders uh, in, in history, you know, like Thomas Jefferson and Winston Churchill, they all kept journals. And I've noticed that, and I thought I should do that as well. And um, I want to no, don't, 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 don't say I should. Don't say should. Well, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do right. that as well. So I, I what I'm going to ask you is, what, <laughs> how do you, what do you do? Because I've looked, I've looked at the page. I bought a nice notebook, and it's like, would I write my to-do list for the day? Or, or how do you, how does somebody who has no journaling experience, how do you get started? How do you get value out of that? All right, excellent. So first of all, there's no wrong way to journal. The journal is for you and nobody else. Assume, hope, pray that nobody reads your journal. I certainly hope and pray that nobody reads the journal until I'm well dead, because there's a lot of very embarrassing things in there as I self-reveal those things that I need to consider. The purpose of journaling is to, number one, slow down your thought processes so that you can self-examine what's going on. So it might, you might write down with, I have no idea what to write today, mm -hmm. which I probably think is a good way to start a journal because starting from a state of, of not knowing is a great way to enter the state of learning. So what is it that I want to learn? Well, I'd like to learn how to journal so it makes the most impact on my life today. Well, what might that be like? That would be a free-form journaling exercise that be your first page. It is completely acceptable. There are no rules. So we can journal in really three strategies. Number one is looking at our past. Why do I do this? Why do I procrastinate on firing somebody I need to get out of my life? And then I start to write those rationale that I can start to examine. That's the past review. Present review. I would I am really feeling happy today. I've never felt the sense of reverence and awe that I experienced looking at Bryce Canyon this morning. I still am feeling goosebumps thinking about that. And, and I want to have more of those peak experiences in my life. So I choose to create a, a, a business that gives me the opportunity to enjoy those peak experiences of reverence and awe. I feel alive when I'm in that environment. That would be a now type of journal entry. Hey, I'm getting my journaling done today. This is great. <laughs> I'm doing a verbal journal to you, Dave. So then the third could be future looking. Um, I want to know what the best steps are to accomplish how to deploy a business that I can sell in the future. Now, while I've got some good ideas, I've got some resistance to digging into that. Why is that resistance? Is it because I'm being pulled by my task today? It's because I haven't offloaded the things that I need to offload to other people so that I have the cognitive capacity to think through this complex thing I've never done before. What is it that I need to be doing, right? So that would be a journaling for the future. Is that helpful? Yeah, very much so. And so while we're on that, that subject um, of kind of this inward looking, uh, you also mentioned assessments. And, uh, you know, like you said, there's a ton of them out there. So if somebody was to, to maybe start their journey by doing some assessments, is it important to have a coach or somebody that can interpret the results or can you kind of do that on your own and um, kind of self-help in a way? All right. So uh, th those are really two different questions. <clears throat> and so I'm going to answer them two different ways. <laughs> the first yeah. is that is that most assessments that you can get online do an extraordinary job of interpretation. And so, for example, you can go to Strengths Finders that is now owned by uh, Gallup. And for 50 bucks, you can understand what your top five strengths are um, and what and how you rank against those five strengths. Mine happen to be perfectly aligned for what I do for a living. No mm -hmm. surprise, right? So what, they, what, what, what we do then is we take a look at those areas where I'm not strong, and then I backfill those with other people. Or um, if it's important to me, then I might work on that. And they give you a really good, lots of great reports in figuring out how to do that. Um, assessments, I think, are also important as we grow our business to make sure that who we hire, um, we don't have blind spots about. Mm -hmm. I think everybody on this call who's hired a person in the past, more than one, has made a bad hiring decision. It's because we are all lousy at hiring people because of our blind spots. We tend to hire people we like 
And we tend to not hire people we don't like when, quite frankly, we have to hire people we don't like to do jobs we don't like to do. Yeah, that's true. And that, that's just one of the basic principles of leadership. You don't have to like them. They just have to be competent. Okay. These are not people you want to go out, have a cocktail with, but by at the end of the day, they're going to check their box. They're going to be happy. They're going to go home and do what they do. So, you know, part of that is that we need assessments to help us make better insights. Now, when it comes to a coach, a coach can take assessments and help direct you where you need to be lifted up. We need to get stronger for the fastest results. Now, the good news is a good coach will help you spot your blind spots and will show them to you in a gentle way. They're not going to beat you up. Coaches that beat you are, aren't coaches. They're, they're, uh, they're sadists. And, and, you know, you don't need to pay for that. Most people can just go home and get that treatment. <laughs> or, or go to Thanksgiving for that treatment. You, you don't need that. So what you want to do instead is find somebody who you resonate with, who you bear your soul to, because coaches are there to help eliminate your blind spots and make you strong. Cool. Hey, Tony. Hi, Dave. Hey, why don't you ask one question from, uh, from our uh, chat box today and see what the folks out there are asking. Okay, but first I would like to let Mark know that he's getting some great accolades out here. Lisa says, wow, this was fantastic. Oh, I'm so, so glad, really Lisa. For the information. I'm so glad. And you need to get out a little so, bit more often. <laughs> I'm just, I'm so just, well, thank Lee, you. I'm, I'm really delighted that you're inspired. Thank you. So I'm sorry. Alan says, how can you determine your own personal best cognitive time? Well, uh, part of it is just keeping a log. You know, when do you feel the sharpest? Um, for some people, they're night owls. They actually have their best cognitive time when when everybody else is going to sleep. Um, uh, some people are early birds uh, where they get up. They might wake up at four o'clock in the morning, have a cup of coffee, and their cognitive capacity is the highest between six and eight in the morning. It's entirely possible. So part of it is, is personal observation and, and log keeping. Um, we get a lot of self-awareness out of keeping logs. And while it feels like it doesn't help us, it actually does. Because one of the aspects that we have as a leader is how quickly do we bring information into our brain and integrate it. And the faster that we can do that, quite frankly, the more flexible we are as a leader to handling disruption. Well, if you keep a log of something that you're trying to figure out and you figure out how long that time takes, then you get your integration time is. And as you create your future, you can dial in that integration time as I know I need two weeks to integrate fully a new idea into my life. And so therefore, I'm going to dial that into my plan. Otherwise, I know the plan is going to be compromised. So logging is going to be helpful. And it's going to, and I wrote an article on that concept of integration time. Um, it's up on LinkedIn. Um, so so you, you'll find that those are the kind of personal insights that you as a leader can use to, to, in, to instinctively and um, intentionally improve your capacity. All right. Um, so just to, just to jump on top of that, because um, uh, earlier in your, your presentation, you were talking about valor and, and facing challenges and this, you know, um, you know, knowing your best time is important, but um, you know, being a business owner myself and, and having um, some businesses that nearly killed me, I know at the end of the day that you can face a lot of burnout or basically PTSD where you have trouble making good decisions or any decision um, that you're just so kind of beat up that, um, that there is no good part of the day. And uh, which is oh, why you run the SBDC center. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I guess so. So, so tell me a little bit. Uh, I get it. What you would, uh, what would you say to somebody who has in that situation? Well, I think that the first thing I'd say to you is congratulations on surviving. You know, business owners have a really difficult uh, life, and we have the, the the scars and bruises and liver damage to prove it. <laughs> yes. So, the, uh, the the reality is that first of all, pat yourself on the back for making it through that extraordinary initiation that we call owning a business. And your job is to now harvest the wisdom of those challenges to reflect back and say, why was it hard? What can I do to reduce the friction? What did I learn? 
How can I create, take that value to others who would also find it valuable and profit from it and have them profit from my learning? And as the director of the SBDC, you can help people by saying, I've been down that path before. I advise you consider it twice before you consider it before you do that. So that's where sageacity, being a sage, comes from. It comes from battle. It doesn't come from reading books of battle. Yeah. And so recognize, and, and I grant upon you this, this, this mantle of sageness, <laughs> which is exactly why you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And your job is to reduce the friction and speed the acceleration of others because your history is their future. Cool. Thank you. What else is out there, Tony? Well, Leslie Stone says, can you please talk about what you're learning about helping large teams, 30 plus or more, plan and solve problems in a virtual environment? She says, team members don't know each other, you know, cross systems and members. Yeah. She goes, what are you hearing and learning? All right. So the first thing that we have to do when we're working with multifunction teams is teach them about communication styles. And that is how a person processes information, which is task specific. So for example, a leader tends to have a general spot style that requires big pictures. A tactician tends to have a specific style because they're zooming into the details that are required to execute the plan. Now, if a tactician doesn't understand why the leader has the big picture uh, demand and they say, how come you don't understand details, then we have problems and friction. And there's about six, there are six of these communication styles that I work with my leadership teams to understand and teach to their teams. So first of all, we, we get that we process information differently, necessarily so for us to be successful. And then we respect each other's view, knowing that we have to have multiple perspectives to have a successful operation. So start with teaching people about communication styles and how each of the players communicate so that we know how to package that information and interpret the information in a positive sense. This to me is the most important stepping point from a team building aspect is we have to at first understand each other before we can move to what everybody's looking for, which is trusting each other. Trust is earned and it is earned by consistency it's earned by keeping our word. It's earned by understanding what each of us are bringing to the table and each other's strengths and each other's shadows. So I think it'd be important to start with that understanding of communication, roles, responsibilities, and then how each other fits to make this team work as a well-oiled machine. A car engine, if every part of a car engine was a piston, it wouldn't run. <laughs> so I have one more question for you. So um, they're asking, who is an example, of, excuse me, an example today of an instinctive leader and why? Oh, oh, all right. So number one, in, in my book, Elon Musk, he is an instinctive leader in that he gets the concept of vision, value, velocity, and valor. That guy understands those four V's probably better than anybody else. And he is willing to disrupt himself and disrupt his business to get that vision, value, velocity, and valor into play. And it is, it's absolutely instinctive. You think he's stopping and thinking? No. He also understands cognitive capacity. Steve Jobs is another great example of that instinctive leader who understood the preservation of cognitive capacity. It's why Steve had the same outfit every day so he didn't have to make a choice about what to wear, which preserved his cognitive capacity. It's why. He took, um, he had a chauffeur take him to work because he knew that driving to work would reduce his cognitive capacity because making those micro decisions chews up decision making uh, uh, energy. So, you know, you think you take a look at some of these folks to do the things the way that they do. They are, they are doing that to preserve cognitive capacity. But I think um, Steve, posthumously, Elon Musk currently are really good examples of instinctors. And I'm not going to talk about any politicians. I think there's some really instinctive politicians out there, but that is too inflammatory just now. 
we might talk about that after the election. <laughs> Do you mind sharing the name of the book that was by Chris Voss? Someone asked about yeah, the name certainly. of the book. Never split the difference. Okay. And if you're not a reader, get the uh, Audible book. Um, Chris uh, narrates it himself. Chris is a fantastic professional speaker. I know him personally. Uh, he's, he really is an amazing human being. You got to buy his book. You got to read his book. You got to use his book. Chapter three is the meat called tactical empathy. It's where we start. Really good. Thank you for that. Now, this is a little off topic, but someone wants to know what mic it is you're using. They said it's so clear. What mic are you it using? It is. <laughs> it's extremely clear. I'm using an Audio Technica uh, 2030, and I've been talking to this mic for 30 uh, for 27 years. So wow. it's. it's you can buy the the um, the USB version called it's an Audio Technical AT twenty twenty, and uh, I run mine through outboard processing to make it sound like I'm in a studio. Uh, but the uh, the outboard AT twenty twenty you can plug straight into your uh, your system, and by using some noise some signal processing, you can get equivalent type of quality. But the other thing is notice that I'm side addressing the microphone. I'm not talking into the microphone. I'm actually talking across the microphone. And that's part of the quality that you're hearing. I started off in radio, so radio voice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, and everything's on topic. Everything. <laughs> so, Mark, you mentioned um, about uh, foresight and how to predict the future. Give us a couple little teasers on how to predict the future in, in business. All right. So, <clears throat> number one is understand Moore's law. Uh, Gordon Moore in 1965, who was a co-founder of Intel, who makes your computer chips, Intel Inside, that was what Gordon created. And he wrote an article that observed the number of transistors on an integrated circuit doubles every 12 months. And he said that that was foreseeable into the future. As far into the future as he could see, the number of transistors would double, which the implication is this, that the compute power doubles every 12 to 18 months for the same price, or we can get the same compute power at half the price every 12 to 18 months. Well, that concept of Moore's Law and the, and the, the uh, exponential growth of technology capacity is true across the board, and we can regress that back into the Iron Age. So fundamentally, look around yourself and say, hmm, the technology that I'm looking at right now is going to be half the cost in 18 to 24 months or twice as capable in 18 to 24 months. So what am I going to be able to do with this? And quite frankly, we would not be able to handle these Zoom meetings if we didn't have extraordinary bandwidth strung around the United States that wasn't predicted until uh, 2015 by um, the founder of Netflix. Oh, his name is escaping me moment, Reed Hastings. In fact, he founded Netflix based on his projection that you would have enough bandwidth in U.S. home to stream videos in 2015. Well, it ended up being actually 2012 when we started to stream Netflix videos. But he did that by predicting the future of when a technology would be available widely. And of course, Netflix is completely disrupted the industry. It's disrupted Hollywood, blockbuster, 9,000 stores, not a single store open any further. We don't go out for videos. We just access video. We don't buy DVDs. We just access them. And that was based on the concept of using Moore's law to look forward at what technology will be available in the future. And what do I do now to make sure that I can exploit that opportunity? So there's one example of how we can look to the future by using Moore's law. Moore's law is absolutely infallible. Hmm. Wow. That's cool. Uh, Tony, we have another question. Um, actually, I think we are finished with the questions over here, but everybody's seeing great information, Mark. And one person in particular said that you were very positive and encouraging, and they are, they said, thank you so much. You're welcome. And by the way, that is a wise leadership instinct trait. Our job is not to artificially create positivity, but genuinely create positivity. And every disruptive opportunity, every disruption generates opportunity, right? In every curse, there's a blessing. and every blessing, there's a curse. As leaders, we pick out what that blessing is. 
Thank you for those kind comments. Now, now that you're inspired, go do something. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go back to your old way of being. Yeah. <laughs> that is well, true. I guess uh, it looks like we're about uh, about 10 minutes over our time, but Mark, I really appreciate you sharing with this today. This was fantastic. And I really made a, I made a ton of notes and, uh, um, and everybody out there, don't forget to take advantage of Mark's offers. Uh, I certainly am. So uh, please do that. And uh, with that, uh, Janet, give us some last words of wisdom. <laughs> Go journal. <laughs> Actually, I did want to ask Mark real quick. Do you think uh, it's uh, more helpful to handwrite journaling or to type, you know, type that out digitally? I have found that handwriting has the most impact on my inner being. And the reason why is because my handwriting slows down my thought process so I can be open to what grew. Excellent. So I handwrite my journal, but I do not handwrite my books. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for you, find out what it is. I the physical manifestation of pen to paper. And I use a pen mm -hmm. because I, I want to include my mistakes because that's part of my learning. My learning is to be, is, is to become friends with my shadow oh. and, and, and with my light and my shadow. So that, that's what I have to do is to be a complete human being. Mm -hmm. And, and I find that that handwriting being okay with my mistakes because nobody learns without making mistakes is part of that process. Journaling is intensely intimate and it is one of the most fantastic ways for you to find the center of your soul from which you can lead and change the world. Very nice. Fabulous. Fabulous. I really thank you for this, Mark. You're welcome. Yeah. Delight. Thanks for inviting me. This was fun. Yeah. Let's do it again yeah. sometime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got more. <laughs> we'll be reaching out, and I'm going to take advantage of your offers. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, I look forward to that. Good, good. So, Tony. Yes, Dave. <laughs> See you next. <laughs> See you next week. And Mark, you were awesome. Thank you yeah, so much. You. Yes, wonderful. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. And thanks everybody for showing up today, and we'll be back next week, next Wednesday, same time, same panel. So please join us, and uh, we'll be talking about podcasting next week. And Mark, thank you wherever you are, Utah, I think, right? All right, Utah it is, mm -hmm. Southern <laughs> Utah, God's country. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, enjoy your day, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Mark. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. -bye.